right. Hi, everybody. It's Maya McGinnis from Yoga Works, and I am here today with one of my most favorite teachers, friends, and uh, colleagues in the Yoga Works world here, Vinnie Marino. Um, we're having a series of chats in celebration of our 35th anniversary, celebrating the legacy of Yoga Works and, and all that it stands for over the years. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Vinny in a moment, but just so you know, Yoga Works was one of the first uh, yoga studio brands to pop up in the United States in the West. Um, and from there, we've created quite a legacy and have a really rich history um, of experience in our teachers and also just in our class offerings. So I'm really excited to be here today with Vinny to talk a little bit more about how he got started um, and his experience with Yoga Works over the years. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Vinny. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you here today. Hey guys, I'm Vinny Marino. Um, I've been working, I've been teaching at Yoga Works since 1999. I think I started practicing at Yoga Works probably by 19, 96, 97, maybe around there. Um, yeah, it's probably, it gets blurry because it's so long ago. Um, <laughs> so Absolutely. I, yeah. I, um, so I've been working, I started yoga when I was a kid in high school in New York. I grew up in the 70s in New York on Long Island and my gym requirement was yoga. You could pick what you wanted. I picked yoga. So as a teenager, that's, I was exposed to yoga. I was doing it when I was like 15 um, with the television. It was Lilius Folan had a TV show, Lilius Yoga and You. And um, I was doing that as like a little teenager stoner kid. And that was my gym in high school. So anyway, uh, it's been a long time. How lucky time. are you? <laughs> it was fun. It was different. It wasn't Vinyasa Flow. The teacher, she brought a candle in. It was in the mid on a carpeted floor. She put a candle in the middle of the room. It was very gentle, meditation-y poses, but very chill. I mean, that's really surprising for, for a high schooler. Like what spurred your interest in signing up for that weird thing called yoga? I can't imagine you had like a, a great idea of what you were in for. Well, I had an older brother in the 60s were really influential on when, what went down in the 70s. So I was... I don't know. I don't want to say, oh, my God, it's my karma. But I, as a kid, I was drawn to reading books like about Zen Buddhism in my teenage years, young teenage years, Alan Watts, Suzuki. So Buddhist books and then Ram Das Be Here Now came out. And also it was a time of a lot of psychedelics and psychedelics kind of like Ram Das's journey was Harvard, psychedelics, India and yoga. Mm -hmm. And my Mine's different without the India piece, but um, it was just in the air. You know, people were in the 70s very much trying to explore higher consciousness, why we're here, what makes us feel good, what's the whole reason for everything. So um, I think I was drawn to it super early. That's amazing. And I mean, growing up in New York, what brought you out West? What brought you to California? Oh, um, that's a whole other thing. I'll do the very <laughs> brief version. So I went to school in upstate New York. Rock and roll was a really big part of my life. The Jefferson Airplane and what would happen in Haight-Ashbury, the rock scene of, you know, the airplane, the doors, the dead. Um, well, yeah. the dead, the doors were actually LA, but California. So when I was just, I dropped out of college and moved to San Francisco to Haight-Ashbury. And Amazing. I was a real party animal. I kept moving from New York City to San Francisco, New York City, San Francisco. And eventually I stayed in New York City, got sober, clean and sober when I was in my 20s. And then I moved back to California and I'd been to it. I had been to I'd been exposed to yoga again. I'm trying to remember. But um, when I moved back to California, I came till I was 1990 and I went to a yoga class. I think Steve Ross was teaching somewhere in West Hollywood. Wow. And I took a class with him and there was music and this woman, Ryan Schumacher, who worked for Yoga Works at one point a thousand years ago, her <laughs> class. And then the gym I lived in was Hollywood in the gym. I took um, yoga classes and they were way more strenuous. Vinyasa flow and Ashtanga was integrating into the culture. So mm -hmm. they were way more athletic class. And I really liked it. And then the classes that added music in, I was like, wow, Sade and, you know, Warrior Two. And for whatever reason, it resonated with me. 
So oh, that's amazing. So when you initially found Yoga Works, was that like a, a real discovery? Did somebody introduce it to you? How did you find your way to Yoga Works? I was trying to think about that because it's blurry what happened first. I Sean Corn and I were friends when we became friends. Um, I don't know if I took the tea, I don't think I took the teacher training first. I think I somehow found Yoga Works. Maybe my teacher in West Hollywood, she used to tell me, I think about yoga works. So I would go out, I lived in West Hollywood, I drive to Montana location and take with Sean Korn and Sal David Ray. And they were together as partners at the time. Yeah. Sean was super fiery, you know, Yang, just the, you, you left it all on the mat. She killed you with poses. Mm -hmm. That was her goal, you know, it was just to destroy you with, you know, warrior two for three minutes and that, you know, crazy classes, but I loved it. And I loved her. She's a tough Jersey broad. And you know, we got along, we became friends. Saul was the opposite. He was very yin and soft and gentle. And then all of a sudden I was at yoga works, taking classes with Eric Schiffman, Rod Stryker, Shiva Ray, Anna Forrest, you know, all these different people. And um, I became friends with Sean. And I think at that time, I did the teacher training first at White Lotus, a 16-day residential training in Santa Barbara. And I was still practicing at Yoga Works. And I met Mati. And she's like, oh, you need to take our training. So I took the teacher training with her and Lisa Wolf and probably in late 97, 98, maybe. And that was the beginning of me getting really immersed in basically Mati becoming my mom in a way. Like she became everybody's mentor mom, yoga mom, you know, she really took us under our, her wing and nurtured us. So I did the training, of course, even after the training in Santa Barbara and the training with Lisa and Mati, I realized I don't know anything. So at that time, <laughs> the 300 hour program was just called advanced teacher training. Yep. And you would take, you record it. There was a, you know, a form to fill out. You would take all these different workshops with all the Iyengar teachers that she would bring in from all over the world, from Gabriella to Ramanan to um, John Schumacher, John Friend at the time before he was on Asara. There was everybody came through Yoga Works. Yoga Works was the place. There wasn't a million yoga studios on every corner. Yoga was still the special like thing. And Yoga Works was like, I thought, and many people, it was like the Harvard of the yoga schools. Yeah. You know, and um, the greatest teachers came through there. So our our advanced training was to um, just do all these workshops. You know, every weekend you'd record Friday night, Saturday. What was her name? Donna Holloman. Yeah. Um, these amazing teachers would come. And then during the week, I would take Iyengar class with Lisa Walford. And I would take class with Chad and Chris Stein. And you'd kind of integrate what you learned in all these workshops. And then we'd always, the great thing about Yoga Works, it was very much a mom and pop studio. So we all would like talk about, we were, you know, yoga nerds. We're like talking about like, well, heel to arch, heel to heel. Why is this? What's the benefit of this? What's that? Well, Gabrielle said, headstand with the hands like this. No, but I thought it's supposed to be like this or finger tucked <laughs> under. And we'd geek right. out about like, what was the right way to do it or what was the best? And um that was really fun because we had a community of all, all the teachers were very connected. Yep. You know, it wasn't Absolutely. like, um, there wasn't, I mean, I never came into yoga thinking I'm even going to earn a living from this in a way. It was like, I loved it. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was hoping to earn enough money to like pay my rent and buy my like kombucha and brown rice kind of stuff, but no <laughs> idea. Um, so I did the teacher training and then the advanced and I was really mentored by Sean in the way, like I started um, subbing for Sean when she left town. She started traveling more as, you know, the yoga journal and workshops and stuff started opening up across the world. Sean jumped in on that. And so she was traveling a lot more and I would basically be her go-to sub. And um, that started working out and people kept coming. And then I did the teacher training again with um, I think Lisa, Mati and Chuck after the advanced training. So I've kept, obviously you just kept studying whatever yep. way it was. 
And I'd go to Mati's Ashtanga class once in a while, which, you know, killed me. And <laughs> <laughs> I just remember Mati's little face and she had that special voice. She would shove her face with her nose into my face and go, your idea of five breaths and mine are very different. Meaning <laughs> I was moving way fast. She was like, she would go and she'd show me like to stretch her breath for like a minute on the inhale and a minute on the exhale. And I was like, she's intense, you know? Um, yeah. So then you know, I started subbing and then Mati came to my class that I was subbing for. And that was the day I was like, oh no. And she came to class and after she met with me, she said, I want to hire you. And she gave me, I think, three classes, prime time, Sunday morning at 1030 and Tuesday, Thursday night at 730, which was kind of unheard of. But she needed me because actually Saul and Sean were breaking up and there was all drama. So he was starting to teach less and disappear. And I kind of started taking Saul's classes over. Now, Saul is very chill and I'm from New York. My energy is very different than Saul's. I'm more like Sean, but I taught these more fiery classes. So, you know, Saul had a big following and I took over those times and it went from 60 people in that room to like five because I was a brand new teacher. <laughs> and it was like, who is Vinny? And I was yep. like, Saul. And then after a few months, people started coming, people started coming, and then it started getting crowded. Mati would always say to me, don't let it go to your head. Because I would go, Mati, there was like 46 people. And then I was like, Mati, it's sold out. And because I was so happy that it was working. And then yeah. I met with her and again, and she said, I was living still in town. And she said, you have to move here. And I said, well, I don't know. Like, is this, am I going to be able to, she goes, this is going to work out for you very well. And I was like, all right. So, and then eventually she gave me 12 classes. Wow. All prime time slots. Yep. And she nurtured me. She, her thing was the classes are doing really, really well. And um, I was very happy and it was fun. And I was, though I was very much yoga works trained, my history with rock and roll and drugs and my sobriety and all that, the music and yoga really connected me on a spiritual level because the music I was listening to wasn't just like, for me, it wasn't background music. Like this yeah. music was like a message of what was going on in the culture, the moody blues, all this stuff was like self searching. What this all about? Why are we here? What are we doing to the planet? And yoga was to me the same kind of vibe in a way. So I was in classes where people played a little Indian music and Krishna Das. I'm like, that's cool but I want to put in Jefferson airplane sure. and I did. And people loved it. And um, Mati had no idea of pop culture or stuff. And she would say like, I hear you're playing Led Zeppelin. I don't know who that is, but I hear your <laughs> the classes is still very good alignment wise. And she'd leave me alone. So <laughs> the music just integrated and then it became kind of, I guess a little bit of my thing. Um, I don't know. Ask me something else because I'm kind of losing. Absolutely. No, I just I do want to touch on for the benefit of those who aren't aware, but many of the names that you've mentioned over the course of our conversation so far are some of the most notable and influential names in yoga's history in the West. Um, so, yes. you know, I, I think it's really interesting, especially for those people who are newer to the practice or who, who are newer to yoga works um, to really recognize like the the um, importance of some of those people and the fact that they came through yoga works and that many um, of them trained teachers that even currently teach for us, including yourself, um, you know, yoga was so different back then. And it wasn't even that long ago when I say back then, um, yeah. but yoga has experienced such an evolution um, as it's gained popularity in the United States. Um, but those people are, are many of the teachers that continue to have, uh, you know, really large presences uh, in Most the industry. All of them. And, yeah, because exactly. if you think of Brian Kess, Steve Ross, almost any teacher that you know of, it, it goes back to one of these people from years yeah. ago. They all came through Yoga Works, you know, whether yeah. they left on a good note, a weird note, a bad note, whatever. They all everybody came through. yoga. There wasn't anything else happening. There wasn't right. a lot of students. There was gym yoga 
And then there was Yoga Works. And Yoga Works was like, you know, you had to know your stuff if you were going to work there. You know, there was kind of yeah. understood that Mati had an eye on you. And, you know, there was a certain, we thought, quality to the people that went through there. And a uniqueness to everybody, too. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that it? that what you mentioned, you know, just about uh, how everybody that was involved and and really took part in the early years in yoga works were were real like yoga nerds like they really wanted to continue their studies and that was really um what brought them to yoga works and and had them stick around you know it wasn't just about making a living as a yoga teacher with which meant something really different back then than it does even today uh it was about continuing your practice as a student um so it was I loving yoga a little bit yeah about it was you loving know, yoga and that, wanting to share yeah. it you know like yeah. I want to share this and I hope I make enough money that I don't have to wait tables or do massage or do another job I hope I can just take care of myself because I love yoga when am I going to practice yep when am I going to teach you know yeah. and that was that my life revolved around you know teaching two classes a day what class am I going in between because I liked going to class I never was I, like Ashtangis have their own practice, but they still came to the room for the adjustments and the group energy. But sure. I've always enjoyed to this day taking classes with teachers. And my practice has changed from when I was doing Sean. Or, and, and, and by the way, subbing for all those teachers that you mentioned when I was brand new, I sub for Shiva Ray, Eric Schiffman, Jasmine, Lisa Walford. I would sub for these people and it was bizarre to Those go for these shoes. Kind of big <laughs> shoes to fill when you're brand new. Like I took a lot of Lisa's classes and I did mentor with her for a long time. So, you know, it worked and I did, you know, we started on blocks and a lot of straps and blocks and Iyengar yoga. Uh, sure. <clears throat> What were we thinking? Um, ask me, what was I thinking or going? Yeah, with? no, I, I just think, you know, for me, I think one of the most interesting things, and as you know, you know, my, my mom was a yoga teacher and she was really involved in the yoga scene long before yoga was kind of like the pop culture thing that it is today. And she yeah. and I always kind of talk about, and she reminisces about, you know, the old days of the practice where it was really just about showing up for the practice. And that was really what the community sprung from. Um, and I think that's, to me, part of what made kind of the legacy of, of both Mati and, and also of yoga work so special is that she created these spaces that communities really grew out of based on their love of yoga. And I think so many of our teachers that we even currently have on staff that have been around for such a long time, it's, it's really their love of yoga is what right, has driven their practice, has driven their careers, um, yeah. and is ultimately why they're still showing up and teaching today, even though teaching has evolved so much, especially over the past couple of years, uh, with the advent of the online. Yeah. And our practices have changed, you know, like, yeah. my practices change. I'm, I'm in my 60s, which is yeah. crazy. But um, <laughs> and I started yoga as a teenager. And through the years, you know, injuries, life, gravity, my desire, my fire to, to learn really extreme poses, mm -hmm. to work super hard each day. Um, that changed. And the classes I've enjoyed, I mean, basic yoga, I've said, I just love doing triangle pose to half moon. Yeah. Um, I'm just happy in a very, I have no fire to be like, how do I get my foot behind my head? If only I get my foot behind the head. That has changed so much for me. I so don't care about that. I'm so grateful to just be in my body. And a lot of times I do do Iyengar yoga, whether it's mm -hmm. on, you know, the through the computer these days. Iyengar works with my body because it's very slow, methodical. And it also, I feel like it informs my teaching. When I take Iyengar classes, and I really love, because I'm still, I would say, a Vinyasa flow teacher, though, there were times at Main Street or Montana, I, would, I mean, after Montana, I taught at Montana a lot, and then classes got too big, and Monty said, you got to go to Main Street. So all yeah. my classes ended up at Main Street. But there were times when earthquakes, natural disasters happen, <laughs> things happen that the class would be really small that day. Sure. And those days, I wouldn't teach Vinyasa Floyd, like, guys, go to the wall, block, strap. And people would love it, because a lot of people took my class every day, and they'd be flow classes. And then the days that I could pull out something completely different 
was so refreshing to me and to everybody else. Cause like they had some stuff they hadn't even seen with, you know, cause they don't take Iyengar classes and I could bring that into the room and that was really fun. But um, my practice has changed through the years, but I still can bring into the vinyasa flow, whatever I feel in my body through Iyengar yoga. Yep. You know? Yeah. And I think that's such a, an amazing thing and was really, you know, one of the hallmarks even of, of the yoga work style and yoga works method as Mati was teaching it. And then eventually as she rolled out the teacher training with Lisa um, and part of what made yoga work so special is that it was really informed um, by what I think of as like the, the technical stuff, um, but was also still very connected um, and, and could you know, you could get on your mat and and do more vinyasa style and get the ayahs out, which I think a lot of people still need um, to this day. So, you know, I, I love to hear kind of how you've kept your teaching consistent with your own practice, even though those two things may not look and feel the same. Um, um, okay. The one thing I was thinking when you were talking, though, the Mati yeah. also, with the Iyengar, bringing it into the teacher training and with Lisa yeah. and the Ashtanga and the flow that they created, like, starting with sun salutations, external poses, internals, yep. you know, inversions, backbends, that whole sequence of like that arc that we have. Mati brought in blocks and straps in these <laughs> classes and in the Ashtanga world, she was frowned upon. They sure. really did not like that she was bringing in props. And um, that was one of the things that Yoga Works, I thought the way our schedule had so many different type classes for so many different type ages and body types, Yep. You know, we had Jasmine's class. You never got off the floor at times, though it was difficult. We had my class and Sean's class, which is a whole other thing, crowds and intensity. Then you had mellow class at two in the afternoon that were like level one, two flows. There was just like, you could find whatever you wanted. We always had restorative classes on the schedule and workshops. So it really, it was yoga for everybody, you know, every body type and every person. Yep. And and I love that. Now, as far as the teaching goes, after practicing for so many years and doing flow for so many years in my body, and I still do it just on a gentle level, I'll do maybe less salutations and add the standing poses in. I know how good yoga makes you feel. And I know if you're not dealing with an extreme injury or something, I know how good a well-sequenced flow class feels yep. from start to finish till, you know, if you've taken teacher trainings, you know, there's like birth is the child's pose and death is Shavasana. And up yep. there is this arc that happens. Now, if it's sequenced in a, I don't want to say well, because maybe that's judgment. To me, it means sequenced well. Um, you feel really good after it. So even if I have an injury and even if something where I've had a flu, let's say, and I could sit home and still practice and still teach, um, I know how people are going to feel from practicing and I could still give them this intense experience yeah. Even though, let's say that day, my body wouldn't do that. And I've also taught through these. And now that especially that we're on Zoom, more than ever, I would like to remind people that you're in your own house, in your own body. There's people from all over the world here. There's a whole lot of us. Some have been doing this for years, really strong. Some have COVID. I've had people email me saying, Vinny, I have COVID, but I still want to practice. And I'm like, do whatever you need. I have an injury. I get lots of emails, my left shoulder, my back, my father died. All of this stuff comes up for people. I like to remind people that yoga will meet you where you are. That a lot of times when we did it in person, which had a brilliance and an energy and a love, but a lot of time, especially in the more advanced classes, people would see somebody hiking into handstand every pose and think, oh, they're really great at yoga. And I'm like, no, not really. They were gymnast. They could do right. this before yoga, and it's not that it's not that impressive. It's beautiful to see different poses, but people would sometimes get confused by the ex, you know an extreme pose, thinking that's yoga. And after doing this for so many years and knowing all these people that can do that stuff, I'm like, honey, she's crazy. Like someone that can do that, <laughs> not any happier in her body. If the right. goal is to release tension and to find some calm inside yourself. Yoga means so much to different people. And I've yeah. never liked, that's why I added rock and roll and psychedelic music to my yoga and other stuff, because I never really liked dogma. I never could sign on to just Ashtanga or Iyengar, or this is the right way. Because I always like it to be, because if you read the text, they'll say yoga is about, you know, union. 
to the divine, to God. Ishpa is paradani. I can't even pronounce it well. He's very proud of that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Connection to the divine. And some yeah. people that come class, they don't want to hear that or think that it means nothing to them. They're thinking, I really got a good work out or work in that calmed my mind body. That's fine. Some people will say, you know, this has opened up my body enough. I want to know more. And they'll start reading the sutras or the Bhagavad Gita and start, well, I want to now that, you know, there's some stuff saying that the asana is just used to open up your body enough to sit in meditation. Now, I know people that do asana for years, they are never going to sit for a half an hour in meditation after the asana practice ever. And it doesn't mean they're bad, wrong. The asana practice to me is a meditation. You know, so when they'll, whenever people say, well, this is yoga, because if you look on Instagram or I don't really look at Facebook as much, there's always people that will post like, well, that isn't really yoga because now I understand what they're saying on some level on certain instances, but there's also like yoga is this changing thing. Yes. And it just means connect to your body, your breath. Some people are drawn to chanting and they never really want to do the asanas. You know, some people are drawn to meditation, but there's the yamas and the niyamas. And then a lot of people just lean on asana. I would say, do what works for the type person you are. Yeah. You know, and asana, like Iyengar talks about, is the most obvious because we live in these bodies. It'll tell you a lot where your mind is. If you can feel, do I know where my leg is? He would say stuff like, well, if you don't know where your big toe is, how are you going to find God if you don't even know where your big right. toe is? So anyway, I was, that was a tangent, but. No, but I think that's great. And I think, you know, that really goes to one thing that I'm very committed to as kind of the, the leader of this organization is, is really helping people understand that yoga is so much bigger than just the poses, but that doesn't discount the benefit or the meaning of the poses at all. Um, You know, to me, like yoga asana has changed my life so significantly. Um, And it really was the entry point for me into getting into, you know, these bigger conversations and and just like brainstorms about things like spirituality and and what it is that we're doing on this planet in these these meat suits. Um, So for me, it's it's definitely was such an important part of my own evolution. And I think to your point, like the practice has undergone a huge evolution itself. And, you know, yoga works was always that place where you could go regardless of your level, your life stage, what you needed on any given day. And we're still that place. You know, we offer a ton of different classes, a a ton of different styles, teachers, um, really with the, the idea that yoga should be made accessible and inclusive across the board. Um, and I think, you know, so much of that has become more obvious over the past couple of years as we've been practicing online and in our homes. It's been really beautiful to see people take more responsibility and greater accountability for how they feel on any given day and be willing to modify, be willing to back off, be willing to do the things that they need to do um, so that the yoga can meet them where they are. And I think it's great that they're home because they're probably getting it by now that the right. pressure, you know, like they're realizing no one's here. I don't have to impress anybody. I try to remind yeah. them, like, be willing, make this the most gentle class. Skip yeah. every vinyasa. Don't bend your leg that much. Um, the And the, like you said, in these meat suits, these bodies that we're in, <laughs> it's not like, well, now that I've done all the asana, now I stopped. Right. The asana still completely changes my mood and my feelings. Totally. You know, like I still need the asana. As long as I'm in this body, for whatever age I live to, I'm still going to want to stretch and move and and open this body up every day or every other day, whatever it is, to to get back in and to feel grounded. So it's yeah. not like, oh, I've done so much asana, I'm going to let that go. And now I'm just going to like think about spirituality and stuff. It's like, no, until you're, you're going to be in physical form. And when you're in physical sure. form, if you want to feel good, you're going to want to do bridge and a forward bend and a triangle pose. Right. You know? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think it's also, it's a really interesting balance too, because I know for, for some of us, myself included, like sometimes I need a little bit of guidance. It's like what you were talking about with liking, you know, being in class, you know, there are some days where I know I have a little more in me and for whatever reason, I just don't want to get there. But when I have the reminder, 
I'm willing to, to step up and say, hey, I am going to explore that or I'm going to try that today and see what happens, um, you know, to the best of my ability without so much judgment, which is a big part of the practice too. Um, but having that support system of being in class and having a teacher, whether it's online or in person, to me is still a huge part of my practice and like yes. why I like to show up on a daily basis. I love to be told, yeah. even though it's <laughs> I've heard it 8,000 times, <laughs> actually that's an understatement, 8 million times how to bend the leg and track the knee or firm the hip. I just love it like a meditation, yeah. hearing a teacher's voice guide you through your body. I, I still love that. Um, yoga worked, I mean, it has changed. When Mati and Chuck sold Yoga Works, it was a huge loss for all of us that, you know, um, had this mom and pop studio that got bought by a corporation, basically. Yeah. It has changed so much, but at the same time, it's still yoga. And I'm very glad, my you are at the helm now because you're yogi. <laughs> You know, yeah. you beside knowing the business aspect of yoga, how to keep this thing going, which is important. You need that. You're also a yogi. So you have that heart with it, which we haven't had in a long time. You know, yeah. we really had people that looked at it from a complete charts and graphs and business standpoint. And like I said, yeah. I've always stayed removed from that kind of because I had my own path of like teaching, doing workshops, doing retreats. I've never been really involved in the business aspect, but it always is different when a yogi actually is behind the scenes. Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 funny, and thank you for saying that. Um, I really appreciate your vote of confidence, but I do think that the whole business of yoga, and I think a lot of people still don't like it when those two words get put together, but you can't deny um, that yoga has very much become a business over the years. You know, it's all these studio companies that, um, are still around, especially those who made it through the last couple of years, which were incredibly trying across the board for any sort of uh, movement yeah. practice or movement studio. Um, you know, any of those companies that are around have to recognize that, you know, there are certain things that are required in order to keep the lights on. Um, but to me, you can do that and you can still maintain a connection to the yoga and the integrity of the practice and how it's delivered. The quality. Um, and that's the most important part. Yeah. But what you're saying is so true. But even beyond just now, the business of it that exploded, yeah. even at the very beginning, Mati was an amazing businesswoman, an incredible yeah, yogi. But Mati was a smart businesswoman. <clears throat> so people don't like to believe it because they think, oh, it's yoga. Monty couldn't keep you on the schedule if people weren't coming to your class. You could be the sure. nicest person. You could know where your legs go in triangle pose or in a back bend. You can have precision alignment. But unless people came to your class and kept this thing going, yeah. Monty would not keep you there. She was a businesswoman. And so we've talked about it, obviously, ad nauseum. But like, <laughs> I'm always annoyed when people think that like the yoga studio is just this thing that just exists. And no matter what you should be able to come and teach there and get paid even if no one comes or three people come. <clears throat> to me, that doesn't make sense. It's like yeah. this place, this space needs to be rented. There's yeah. heat, there's water, there's yeah. teachers that have to be paid. There's people that sign people in. It's yeah. a business. Mati knew that from the beginning and she yeah. ran it well and, yeah. and knew how to build a very successful financial business. Eventually yeah. it was sold, but for years, she looked at numbers and just said, what's going to work? What's going to work here? What's going to work there? But she mentored us. She would be like, this person is not going to be great for a, for a major time slot, bring in 100 people. But, you know, at two in the afternoon, they're good. And, she, you know, she had an eye for everything. And we sure. trusted her and the vision. So yeah. there is the business aspect of owning a studio. Um, you know, I think. One last thing, and you know, this is this is in my my mind a little bit of a tricky question, just because I think you have so much knowledge as a teacher and as a practitioner, and over the years, and you have so much wisdom just based um, on what you've seen go down over the years at Yoga Works and in the industry at large. But yeah. if you had just one thing that you could share with your students, what would that be? Oh, to keep practicing, no matter what, you know, like yeah. I mean, if if to my students, when you say, because I know people that have been practicing for years and years, I would say keep practicing as you go through these life changes. Let the practice come with you through getting older. Yeah, That's the one thing. And 
and find and maybe like in this even find different teachers because I've had I've had different teachers through my life that worked for me. You know, like at that period of time, it was a perfect fit. And then that wasn't as fit as much. If I had to like go somewhere else, I would say try a whole lot of different stuff. Don't get stuck on one path or one thing. Try a whole bunch of things. You know, this is this isn't just one thing. But I also, if you're really into yoga, I would try to put in like Monty told us. I would try to put in one Iyengar class a week if you like to do flow. Yeah. Um, I would try to put in one restorative class or one Yin class a week into your schedule. You know, I would try to mix it up that your body has a different experience. I feel so like keep there's a, a life analogy in there too, Vinny. <laughs> try a lot of things, do different things. Don't get stuck in the habits. Yes. When I see people that, I mean, even though I'm appreciative that they've been in my class forever for 20 years, if yeah. someone's practicing on, I guess it's easy to do that if you know kind of the poses and stuff or the, the rhythm of a class. When you start practicing on autopilot, I think it's like, go do Zumba for a week or go jogging or go swimming, like let go of the yoga until you can come back with a beginner's mind. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like that was something, you know, especially um, the last time I practiced with Monty, which was in early 2019, I remember having a conversation with her and she said, Maya, you know, you have to do something that you don't like every day. It's the most important thing just to give you yeah. perspective and to let you come back to your mat or to come back to your life uh, with a beginner's mind, with that different approach uh, so that you don't fall into just the things that you like and, you know, making your life really comfortable. Because as we know, none of us really experience any growth <laughs> when that's the case. I hate that that is the situation, but it's true. No <laughs> risk, no growth, no uncomfortability, no growth. Yeah. I want it to just be, you know, lots of pancakes and resting and growth. And right. it's not. <laughs> it's, it's coming up against friction and tension that yeah. creates the growth, which that's how life is. Maybe I wouldn't have designed it that way if I was, you know, God, but that is the path we're on. It definitely is. And I think uh, more than anything, at least for me, uh, the yoga has shown me that over and over and over again. So I'm so grateful for the practice and um, so grateful for you. Thank you for taking the time well, to spend for you. with us. And, um, you know, for those of you that don't know, Vinny still teaches for us four days a week on our digital platform <laughs> and you can find him on our schedule. Definitely check his class out. I personally love it myself. Um, and we'll be uh, in touch again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for letting me share all this. And thanks for being at the helm of this latest experience of Yoga Works. Absolutely. Thanks, Vinny. All right. Thank you.